so the grassroots committee started um, just a little over three years ago. Um, and it has been chaired by our board member and vice president, Nate Hurst. Um, and I will need to lean on Mary for the current count of members in that committee, but I think we're between about 10 to 15 sort of on the list of people who have at some point participated in it. And then the meetings tend to uh, be between six to eight people, um, which is actually still a really very healthy sized group for um, the conversation and, and sharing of updates that people do in that group. Um, the other committees that NADA has that are open for members to join include the Advocacy Committee, um, and that's a space where members can get some support if they're interested in making legislative changes in their state to have NADA more accessible and barrier-free, um, whether that looks, that typically looks like getting a lot either brought into the state as a, a new ADS law or expanding an existing law. Um, and that committee has had about the same length of time as the grassroots committee. Um, we have a public relations committee or, yeah, public relations um, and a membership committee. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> trying to make sure I get them all. That's okay. We <laughs> want um, any member to feel free to uh, connect with us if you'd like to join a committee. They are open to all NADA members. Um, and there's a little, just a little form for you to fill out if you have an interest in being on one of these committees and um, participating uh, more actively as a member of NADA. And I believe we'll be talking today more about sort of what a grassroots committee meeting looks like. And I think you'll get a sense of that when you hear from people sharing their experience of being on the committee. So um, yeah, thanks for giving space for an introduction about committees because they're a great way to um, get m kind of more connected as a member of the NADA community. I'm Nate Hurst. Um, I'm located in, well, I live in the Twin City area. Specifically, I live in St. Paul right now. Um, I am currently the vice president of NADA, and I am the chair of the both the uh, grassroots committee and the nominating committee. Um, my connection with NADA started early 90s. I was trained at Lincoln Hospital. At that time, I was living in my hometown of uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and I was myself, uh, Katura, Ryan, and Claudia. We trained at uh, Lincoln Hospital in the early 90s. Subsequently, we were all in New Haven, and uh, we actually started doing training before there was any real trainers in Connecticut. We started training people in New Haven. Uh, I would pass it on to my co-chair, uh, Yao. Uh, I love this. Yeah, I, I, I knew he was going to jump to me, and I'm, and I'm appreciative. Uh, listen, love everybody. Uh, I, I haven't been able to slide to see who all is actually on the tiles, but I'm just so grateful when, when, when our community, uh, us, are able to, whatever we're doing in our lives, to put a little time to come together. You know, uh, just real briefly, um, <clears throat> I don't know if Maisha Mitchell is on from Tallahassee, Florida, but I actually, uh, it was through uh, her partner at the time, Zaye Haynes, that um, we were doing some real grassroots work uh, around uh, black liberation uh, in the South and, and, and just nationwide. And we were coming from a conference um, and one of the writers got really sick after eating a pretty healthy amount of Chinese food and pulled the, pulled the van over and Zai came out with some needles and boom, 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 boom. And the next thing Faye Williams was like, wow, what was that? I feel really good. And I was like, yeah, what the fuck was that? Um, and so that sort of tweaked, tweaked my interest and 
And then, you know, coming back and forth, um, because I did attend Florida and University, and Tallahassee is, is, is one of those hometowns, but New York is also to another, another one of those places. So I'm hanging with my grandfather, and I come across, oh, Lincoln acupuncture. I come across Banner. I come across Matula Shakur. I come across Uri Arana Trinidad. I come across uh, 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 B. Kinsey. I took classes at Banner. I mean, so all of that started infusing me, you know, in terms of that. And plus, by the way, I am a social worker, you know, by training, you know, I got my master's and all of that stuff. Uh, so community organizing has always been a part of that. Um, so I, I, I did work uh, at Lincoln for about five years and this was in the late 70s, early 80s, and I think around 85, NADA was getting incorporated and doing its thing, although the, the, the thinking started like manifesting itself in 1983. Um, so I, I also realized that <clears throat> I don't cult with any shit, really, and, and, and I'm speaking as a Buddhist, but, you know, I, I, I have to open up and, you know, get, you know, expand beyond. So I, um, and, and, and I say this in a, in a positive light, not that, you know, not a Lincoln or a cult, but you do have to check and make sure that microchip isn't been inserted in the back of your brainstem. And so I started going out further in the communities within New York City and, and really uh, like teaching and bringing and, and treating and, and, and offering these kinds of uh, uh, services and uh, healing spaces to marginalized communities. So you know, folks that were formerly incarcerated, folks uh, uh, we were able to do a collaborative. We were able to open up an acupuncture program using the NADA protocol at Harlem Hospital. And I got to tell you, Harlem Hospital was real conservative, even though it's in the black community, all right? But we, we convinced Dr. Curtis, I mean, uh, and here, you know, Dr. Curtis is one of the few black psychologists, you know, that I knew of, you know, growing up. Um, and Real conservative, he sort of remind you of Orville Reckenbacher, the popcorn person. He always wore a bow tie, you know, and he always, you know, my name is Dr. Curtis. But he was able to ease up and loosen up and, and really open to this, this protocol. And we, we had a really good run. We, we had a really good run. And that opened up even to larger aspects of, of bringing this protocol to people. So currently right now, uh, I, I'm really proud of it. after Lincoln closed and you know all of the things that happened with that. Uh, it, the trainers, um, uh, ADSers were just sort of fractured and scattered all over the place, and we were able to kind of bring people together. And I and I owe this to NIDI, the New York Harm Reduction uh, Educators um, Association, and this is where Juan uh, Cortez comes out of. And, and Juan had been doing ever since he had come through Lincoln and his own um, 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 uh, journey and, and his path uh, wanted to, to start training more people. And so we collaborated it through him and his effort, got together the first training uh, that happened in New York City since the closing of Lincoln. And, and, and we, we collaborated with another harm reduction program uh, up further up uh, in, um, the Upper West Side of Manhattan, uh, Corner Resources, um, really awesome. I mean, folks were into not only acupuncture, but clean needle, uh, uh, safe injection sites, all of those things that are necessary uh, for, for, for offering a plethora of treatment opportunities for people to, to, play, uh, to, to come into. But it was not a, it was the protocol that helped open up people to say, you know, Maybe I could use some counsel right now. Maybe, maybe could I could I talk to somebody, you know, after the needles come out? So it's that. Also, too, um, the work here uh, in New York City, uh, Pillars is a program that started in um, uh, Central Harlem, and that's where um, um, Nancy's um, son-in-law, George, um, George is the um, ADS. A practitioner at Pillars, and he's just doing wonderful things and opening up all uh, all other kind of avenues to wellness healing, uh, where they you know started doing sound healing and meditation and yoga, and and other kinds of things. And then one of my other uh, favorite projects has been working with a program called Reciprocity. And um, Joanne Linney had done a lot of work years ago with Reciprocity, uh, Taz Tacor, 
uh, uh, has been running uh, that that program, which started off really originally to offer shelter services, um, love and care to LGBT youth who were landing in New York homeless. You know, as so many people want to get from their oppressive situations all over, you know, the United States. And one of the things that comes into them, let me go to New York City. So they come to Port Authority and they land there. And of course, you know, the vultures are there and, and it's, it's hard. Um, um, these kids, these younger people, they were living in what they call the salt mines, which was the sanitation department uh, where they kept all of the, the, the stuff that they put out when the snow is coming. Uh, so they had it in mounds. These young people were living in these mounds. So, so Taz and, and um, just those, those lovely people, this was like 15, 20 years ago, were bringing people. And she's always been committed to training the very community of the people that we work with. So we had a wonderful training at a, um, a, a Shambhala Meditation Center upstate New York. Um, and we trained, like these, these young people are so eager to want to know and learn. So, oh God, it's just been wonderful just being part of that flow. And even with the, the laws and regulations here in our state here in New York, New York but and, and elsewhere, everybody, we're all struggling with it. But you know what? Beads and seeds have been liberating, so we continue to do the training. We continue to offer the the, the practice, and it, it's it's been really good. Um, speaking from land previously protected by the the Lenape, and I really am hoping Bob is on. Anybody that's doing work in indigenous communities, I hope Rita is on to talk about what she's doing. I hope. I hope the Florida folk and the contingent there are, are, are going to talk about what they're doing and whether you're doing something in your neighborhood or at your community center or please talk about it. Thank you. Peace. But yeah, we're doing, uh, we're doing small reach into Indian country. Um, Melinda Seltzer and I went down to Detroit, did a small face-to-face -face with American uh, Indian Family Health Services, uh, scheduled up a couple of return visits to make sure that everything's on track there. They're very, very interested in reaching out to that community uh, as well as um, the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, they are very far west uh, Detroit, um, the Arabic Muslim community is right there. Um, but yeah, there's some real interesting things that hopefully are going to get built upon and continue out there. Um, some of the trainings in Michigan with the other tribes has um, definitely slowed down since uh, COVID-19. Uh, and uh, in talking with Dolores, uh, she's doing a tremendous amount of outreach to other tribes in Oregon. And uh, if you know, restrictions kind of lift from there, um, hope to be out there and do some, some trainings as well. Um, yeah, a lot of this, uh, this seems to be, especially with grassroots, uh, real small numbers, real intimate type of uh, training situations with people who are very, very, very interested in being able to provide this, uh, this service. Uh, you know, and as Dolores points out, uh, you know, it started out in their behavioral or primary care, then has swung through all departments at uh, at the Umatilla tribe. Um, yeah, doing, doing pop-up uh, clinics, uh, COVID's, COVID's messed with us a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's through a lot of individual outreach. Um, mm -hmm. You know, IHS is supportive, um, but uh, I don't know. I've just never really had much of an opportunity to um, interface with them. Good question, though. <laughs> yeah, but, sure. I, I went because there, there is that. Um, I, uh, 
I fall on the word confluence all the time, but uh, uh, between like when you have uh, the IHS clinics and then you have um, certain facilities that aren't on a reservation that maybe a tribe will send their people to like a rehab, for instance, it's off res, but they refer their tribal members there. And so, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we were, I think you and I had this conversation and there really aren't a whole lot of indigenous only um, treatment centers. Uh, there's right. the one in Northern Wyoming. Uh -huh, Thunder uh, Child, yeah. Yeah, but a lot of times um, nobody thinks to ask. So part of the outreach is like Wind River. You know, um, I know Susie Sue works up there or is from that area. Um, Dolores is from that area. And it's kind of making those individual contacts rather than waiting for IHS to do anything. But but that's the spirit of NADA. That's, you know, a lot of what the, the grassroots committee is, is... Uh, um, trying to identify where there's a need and then how can we best assist in filling that need. And that's gotten us through and into a lot of, um, a lot of very interesting places. So, um, yeah, I, it, it's like back in the day when we trained, um, the group in, um, in Detroit, all community based, they you know, they really can't afford the big bucks for training and hell, they set up on a street corner. They're on the uh, east side of Detroit and we're having great turnouts. Um, as far as grassroots goes, you know, uh, my experience is you're only limited by your imagination um, and it costs us absolutely nothing to ask. Um, and pun intended, but um, there are also some very other good ways of planting the seed and letting it grow. Um, you know, the beads and seed outreach. Um, it doesn't take a college genius to figure out how to place a, uh, an ear seed behind the ear. So, and, and I think the video showing uh, Sarah's son involved in it, perfect, absolutely perfect, you know, so, um, yeah, I'm very encouraged, you know, with Yao and Nate and, uh, you know, Dolores, uh, you know, even Melinda, uh, recently trained, uh, is just like, why, why aren't more people aware of this? Why, uh, why isn't everybody doing this? And, you know, to be able to sustain that newly trained individual, um, rather than pounding them with rules and regulations, providing opportunity. So that's my soapbox. I'm done. Hi. Um, wow. Well, you know, first of all, three years ago when I was asked to be on the committee, I didn't really know exactly what that would mean. And I, um, although I'm connected with people who, you know, and I know people intimately who have been with NADA since the beginning, I have not, um, but I do have a, you know, a deep connection with Ruth and John Ackerman and, and they are the ones who have kind of guided me to NADA. Um, we learned the NADA protocol in school and we, um, instantly I was drawn to it for its, um, you know, kind of nervous, relaxing the nervous system, calming the mind and detoxing the body. And, and at that time I was in a high stress situation. And so I got to find firsthand the benefits of it. Um, and then being a part of the committee, really hearing everyone speak about their experiences and, and how they're getting out into the community um, has been very impactful for me. I lead a nonprofit here in Santa Barbara called Healing Opportunities. And we, um, I, uh, that organization was started in 2000 where we would go into the homes of terminally ill patients and treat um, 
not just the, the patient, but all of the people caring for the patient, so treating the caregivers. And, and as a part of that program, I was an intern and I would go into the homes and be the tr you know, treating. And we used um, NADA, we also used breath work, massage, counseling, um, yoga. <clears throat> and so I got to experience that at, as a practitioner for several years. And then um, I became in 2006, the president of Healing Opportunities. And we've gone through a whole array of, of experiences, but we now, in the last three years, have really focused on using the NADA protocol to care for the caregivers, to care for those people who are caring for people in our community. And we also, um, so we do that on a big, uh, that's our biggest um, effort, but we also treat, uh, we volunteer at the Homeless Women's Clinic, um, uh, twice a month. We have a group of volunteers who go there. And with COVID, um, everything has shifted. And so that clinic shut down. They didn't know how they were going to make it work. We tried meeting in a park once. Um, that's run through doctors without walls. So acupuncture is an adjunct to that. But the funny thing is, when they opened up in the in a in a courtyard outdoor setting, um, they were ready to go with their materials of medical supplies and um, you know, personal hygiene supplies and, and other clothing and such. The people who came for that clinic only wanted the nada. They're like, we're here to see the acupuncturist. So it felt really good. It was really, um, you know, for us, it felt really good. The downside of it was the big effort that Doctors Without Walls put out um, for them didn't feel you know, it, it, they, it, they didn't feel connected to that. So they have since, um, they're, they're changed, you know, they're, they're figuring out what's going to work for them in terms of, of how, how it's going to look. So that program is on hold. And as a committee acupunct for the healing opportunities, we got together and we thought, well, we don't want to be on hold. Like we have volunteers who are ready to go out there, ready to help. What can we do? And so we've been um, doing a couple different things. We, we do Sundays in service, which is called, um, it's Sundays in service, practice what you preach. And that is really a call in to all of the caregivers out there to take care of themselves and to come and to receive um, the NADA protocol. And we can't do that as, as easily right now. So we've been doing a couple of Zoom um, sessions where we give care packets. We put together little care packets and we have them either pick them up or um, we drop them off and they have an essential oil. Uh, they have the magnets or seeds and then they have like a little mantra or saying. Um, and then on the Zoom, we'll guide them through a guided meditation. We'll show them how to put the um, tax on or the seeds on and and then we'll kind of we set aside some time to listen and to talk and to you know gonna get remind them of the importance of taking care of themselves and so we found you know COVID obviously has disrupted a lot but it has rerouted us in a way and, and made us be creative in a way that we might not have done I think I know I was very resistant to to doing online anything because I think there's an important part of touching the person and being in communal, you know, being in the space with them. Um, so we're trying to combine it with these little care packets so that there is a sense of exchange happening when we're giving them their care packets. Um, so we're looking at taking our volunteers now and bringing them out into the community and going to, um, and just having them, uh, be creative. So for example, I have um, a list of people that, you know, will tell me they're stressed out or whatever. And so I'll put together a list of 10 people and I'll go out either to their offices if they're at their office or to their home or wherever. And I'll just put the, the um, tax on. And then if they're at their office and there's three other people there, I'll, you know, I wear my apron and I treat them as well. So I'm just, we're just trying to get out there and treat as many people as possible. Um, and having that, that energy of NADA out in the community as much as possible. We also work with um, 
as many of you already know, the, from the grassroots committee, we work with the Medical Reserve Corps. So when everything first hit us, it was, you know, there was a lot um, of stress placed on the public health department. So we went up there and did the NADA protocol early on. And now we're cycling through um, their offices um, on a some on a once once a month basis um, and treating the employees in public health. So we wear masks um, and we use hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. um, so every space is different. We we were actually calling it. Oh, what did I write down? Um, we 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 curate it to the environment. So if I'm going to, you know, public health, they have, it's a mix of bags. So they'll have an, um, a room with a table that when you walk in the room, you have hand sanitizer, people will sit down um, just in chairs, not touching the table, and then we'll put their ears in. We're wearing masks. Um, they are, some are, or some aren't wearing masks. And... Um, then we put the tax in and then they leave and then the chairs are wiped down. Other places, other times I go right into their um, office space and we approach from behind, you know, we, we, we say hello, we look at each other, we say hello, and then we kind of come in from behind to each side and then we leave. We don't touch anything. They don't touch anything. Um, Interesting. So, so is there like state, is a your state is open then there's, not really any state regulation. Um, I don't know what state you're in. I'm in California. I'm in you're California. You're in California. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, there's masks required and social distancing. Those are the, you know, those are the requirements. We don't have a large group of people sitting around in a circle like we used to. We don't uh -huh. have, you know, even the, the organizations that I go to, um, once a week, we go in once a week and do it with their employees. They, they, we moderated that so that everyone's not sitting in the conference room. They're pretty much in their cubby, their little rooms mm -hmm. around and they'll come out to the door. We'll put the tax in and then they'll go back into their, their room. And, um, some people really like the needles. So, you know, they want the needles, they want to be sitting there with the needles for 20, 30 minutes. Um, and we do that as well. And that's just with the organizations that we already kind of have a, um, a regular schedule with. Um, but well, thank you yeah. for sharing that, Rachel. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Because mm -hmm. some, some people out there are wondering, like, how are people doing it in their state? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, um, I think we're being cautious. You know, we're not, um, we're not being cavalier about it, but we're also not letting it hold us back, you know? I mean, I don't, I, I think that if I'm wearing a mask, I, I don't wear gloves. I think I don't, I, the, the concept of gloves, um, unless I'm take, putting them on and off for every single person, which seems ridiculous to me. Um, you know, when I, when I see a waiter at wearing gloves and the, it, it, the whole thing, it, it's like if you're putting on the glove and taking off the glove during every single transaction, then fine. But if you're at the market and you're wearing gloves all day long and you're holding, it, 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 it seems worse to me than, than, um, right, right, right. so anyhow, but so we, you know, we're using precautions and we are also, um, you know, treating as many people as we can. Um, what else? I wanted to just kind of answer some of your questions here. Um, I really, I, I, what I really appreciate about the grassroots committee is, um, is again, being connected to people who have, who've been there since the beginning. And then also, you know, I'm an acupuncturist by trade. I practice oriental medicine. We, you know, I, I'm not a counselor, although we are trained in, you know, looking at people's physical, emotional, and biochemical health and well-being. Um, so we, tr we treat all of that at once, but it's interesting to me to hear about um, different things that are going on in the reservation or different things that are, are going on in the big cities or, you know, um, just a, a, an array of things that aren't necessarily how I'm doing it in my um, small town. And, it, and it's inspiring. It gives me um, ideas. <laughs> um, 
you know, I think in, in the spirit of NADA, I think being resilient and rerouting has been one of the things we've, you know, been talking about at Healing Opportunities. It's like, um, we spent all last year creating our programs and creating this kind of a to Z route that we would take, um, rewriting our mission and, you know, creating volunteers. And, and then all of a sudden it was like, <laughs> it's all completely gone. Um, but what's not gone is, you know, our ability to put on our apron and uh, get out there and share um, the NADA protocol. I mean, I had a high executive yesterday runs, you know, um, a big organization and she said, you know, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I have high blood pressure, heart palpitations. What do I do? I said, I'll come over to your office right now. I'm going to give you nada, you know? And then yeah. five people in her office were like, what's going on? Why well, I want that? You know, and I had extra. So there I was putting in the needle. So that's that I think um, being in that spirit is, um, is really important because it helps us to just be flexible. Um, and then um, and, and then again, I think, you know, for us, working with the caregivers has really been um, instrumental because we're trying to start, you know, we're trying to get the idea out there to people who wouldn't necessarily care for themselves or, or even think that they, that NADA would benefit them. It's always like, Oh, it's for you. It's for someone else. And so I think when they realize that it's not just for someone else, it's for everyone. That's where, um, that's where it can, we can integrate it um, on, on a more, on a deeper level. Um, so we're in conversation right now with Cottage Hospital. Um, the the one of the board members for Doctors Without Walls is also on um, the board at Cottage Hospital here in Santa Barbara, and he is. We are in conversation with um, getting the protocol done for nurses or for staff um, at the hospital. And I think that will be huge because the hospital has a, um, has a big influence in our community and they really, they're, they did a whole rebranding over the last five years on, you know, making health um, proactive being proactive in one's health rather than reactive. And I think, you know, holding them to that standard, uh, this is something that is proactive. Say how much this is informing me, you know, a lot of little gaps in history I don't remember. And that, yeah, with the comment you made about <laughs> traveling and somebody gets sick and Zaid giving the needles was absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah, and the number of people that would come to our clinic there in Tallahassee uh, from across the country to get acupuncture was just, uh, to me, phenomenal. So thanks a lot for that shout out. And, and then Zaid is on board too, so I don't know if you heard what you said. Um, Zaid um, has been working in our community for many, many years. He's done a lot of training for all of us in Tallahassee. And we are so happy that he uh, has agreed to uh, step up and talk a little bit about his orientation to NADA um, and his experience with Michael Smith. I know he's just going to give a little bit of uh, tidbit stuff, but nothing too long. But later on, perhaps some more information to follow up. Uh, his extraordinary history um, in the beginning of this project. So Dr. Haynes, you want to say a word about some foundational work with um, uh, Brother Matulu and um, Dr. Smith? I'm thank okay you. now. Can you hear me? Yes, you are. I can hear you well. Thank you. Thanks for Okay, yeah. Thank you, Maisha. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, first of all, I want to say how much I appreciate hearing stories from the other persons um, on the call. Um, very, very helpful to me, give me some insight. Um, yes, yes. Um, you know, it's been a while since um, I met Michael Smith and uh, um, being introduced to him from activists in, in that community at that time. As you all know, it was a lot of turmoil 
uh, political, civic um, upheaval, the drug uh, epidemic was, um, was, was, was causing a lot of um, uproar. People were demonstrating, um, asking for help, uh, and, and uh, the, the activists, the Black Panther Party, Republic of New Africa, the Young Lords, um, um, all of them were involved. In, in, in trying to get um, some help um, to the to the um, ad addicted addicted community, and there were there was a lot, you know there was cocaine the beginning of crack there was heroin there was alcohol there was all kinds of um, things in that mix, and um, Matulu and um, the other groups that I mentioned were spearheading. Um, the movement to to try to get some help. Um, it was very it was it was critical. It was critical, and um, Lincoln Hospital was the focus of their attempts in the, in that in that region. And um, you know there was political involvement. I think it was either Ed Koch or some of the other people, uh, Mayor Ed Koch, and um, uh, some some other politicians were involved. They're all putting pressure in different areas to try to see. Try to keep the protests and demonstrations from exploding. Mm. And uh, Lincoln uh, got involved. I, I'm not clear about how exactly that happened, but um, I just want to make it clear that um, Matulu was and an another organization called Bana, and um, um, I think there was a third organization. I can't remember the name, but uh, Matulu had gone to China and uh, had um, gotten some um, education, some information, some, some training along the lines of the, the barefoot doctor. He was able to get some information, uh, well, not information, but education on um, the philosophy behind acupuncture. And as you all know, um, China was just, um, had just recovered from um, a long period, uh, perhaps a century, where um, uh, opium was the um, the addiction of, of choice. Uh, the British and some of the other colonial powers had, um, or imperialist powers had, brought uh, opium in, and um, it, it was it was devastating um, Chinese people. So uh, Matulu was. Um, benefited from getting that information, um, visiting clinics and seeing how acupuncture was, was applied um, to treating um, opium addicts. So he brought that back. And this was prior to the establishment of NADA. This was prior to Michael Smith being um, nominated as the person to head up the, the, the drug clinic at Lincoln Hospital. Um, um, to Michael's credit, he, he, he moved in, he accepted the job. Of course, he was an MD, psychiatrist. And so he brought a, a lot to the table. Um, and he, you know, uh, after um, Matulu, um, I think he was uh, targeted. I know he was, he was targeted and arrested and imprisoned. So um, he faded out of the picture. And um, fortunately for all of us, uh, Michael Smith took over the head of um, Lincoln uh, Detox. And it was um, shortly after Michael took over that I was introduced to him by Bilal Sunni Ali and his wife, uh, Kalani. Now, they took me to his office. We had a few sessions. Um, I, so I, I got to, I got introduced to him, was able to talk to him personally, and then uh, uh, trained in his clinic. So I was able to see, you know, the up close and personal. The scene was the actual scene in the in the South Bronx, uh, with 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 uh, addicted persons, uh, you know, crowding into the clinic to try to get help. Uh, mm -hmm. Dedicated people uh, in in Michael's clinic um, doing the job. Um, it was it was it was amazing to see. Um, people sitting in chairs, relaxed. Mm -hmm. uh, these are people who would otherwise be in the streets, um, on the corners, in the alleyways, um, 
all kinds of abuse going on, personal abuse, family abuse, domestic abuse, um, all kinds of things going on, crime. But when they came into the clinic, they were, it was, it was very peaceful today. A real contrast uh, inside the clinic as opposed to what was going on outside in the streets and in the alleyway. Um, so immediately I was struck by the level of organization, um, the protocol that was being used, the acceptance by the people who came in for help, men, women, young, old, um, <laughs> you name it. They were in there, um, pregnant women, um, women who had just delivered. Um, it was, it was, it was almost overwhelming to see, to, you know, to, to witness that. Mm -hmm. And the dedication of the people who were, who were um, uh, applying the protocol. So I guess in short, I'll just say, I saw how the NADA protocol worked um, from the early days when it was really critical that um, this method um, was successful. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine what would have been the case had it not worked for the people who needed the help. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that, that's basically, you know, my perspective from the, uh, shortly after the foundation of, of um, the drug clinic at Lincoln Hospital. So, you know, I, um, I was able to meet some of the people um, the, the acupuncture, uh, uh, the acupuncturist, the, the NADA people. Uh, I, I came in as a trained, I was, uh, came in as a trained acupuncturist. I've been trained in Boston and um, I had my license. Um, and so, you know, I had background, I had some background in, in acupuncture. So it was uh, fairly easy for me to, to adapt um, the protocol to my own practice. Um, but it was at the same time, uh, had a lot of admiration of people who had no acupuncture background, but mm -hmm. who got the training, took the training, and was able to apply it effectively. I mean, mm -hmm. I learned some things about needle insertion from them, about how to, you know, mm -hmm. insert the needle uh, painlessly um, and so forth how to, you know, improve my so-called bedside manner, um, how to relate to, 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 the, to the clients, to the people who needed it, um, how to use, um, you know, things like music, um, um, herbal teas, you know, and, and how to really improve my uh, studies to, to be a better student mm. of acupuncture, you know, to really dig right. deeper um, because, you know, I, I could see how it was effective and there's nothing like seeing it firsthand, you know, to uh, clarify your viewpoint. So um, basically that, that's, that's it. I hope I haven't bored you guys, but. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Great. Oh my God, not only if it's a longer story, we can tell that one later about um, Dr. Smith's travels to um, St. Louis, where he did training with us, with our clients and with our patients at the hospital there. And many, many great stories coming out of that. And, and thanks to, to Nancy and her great work and the other partners that he worked with there. So we have other stories to share, but we both take up all the time. So thank you for allowing that time, Doc. Um, and sharing with others your experiences. Thank you. To You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Hi, good. Um, good afternoon. So, you know, I'm on the membership committee, but I just have a dotted line to the graduate committee. But, you know, what I take away from the committee is you know, listening to the stories and 
um, the sharing of opportunities that others have had and have taken, you know, have been bold in and made their way into um, using the NADA protocol and in, you know, making every situation work regardless of what the challenges are. And um, so, you know, I just have this, I just walk around with this stone in my shoe all of the time um, where I'm trying to figure out, you know, how to, to develop, a, create a coalition and an allyship with acupuncturists so that there's not this feeling that ADSs are encroaching on their territory or um, that it's, um, you know, that it's, it's a battle that there's, you know, ADSs and acupuncturists just are constantly in conflict. There's space for everybody in this universe to do what needs to be done. And so, you know, I'm a physician by training, so I certainly understand, you know, territory and physicians are some of the most territorial animals that the master ever created. And so I understand that feeling that somebody's encroaching on your territory, but that's not my personal point of view. There's enough of, of plenty to go around for everybody. And so I, I want to, to try to identify and find that allyship with acupuncturists where we can join together and support um, ADSs and you know, just have some universal change in laws and change in spirit and change in heart and change in mind thought, mindset so that, you know, AccuDetox can be available to everybody and that all of those people that we trained as ADSs that now live in states or laws have now been enacted that make them not able to practice I want to just remove that barrier. But, you know, I know it has to be done just sort of one person and one state at a time, but I wish there was some universal way that people can be trained as community workers and, and, and be seen as that as community workers and allies to acupuncturists to do acu detox. We stay within our protocol and, you know, there've been no lawsuits that we know of where ADS is, um, have been sued practicing the protocol as it is designed. So I'm just looking and praying for those allies. So in this time such as this, where there's civil unrest and there's open conversations about lack of access to healthcare, this is a perfect platform to to present to the community as a health as as a opportunity for health and wellness. So that's what I'm looking for. And that's what I'm looking for and always want to hear from the grassroots committee. Yeah, I wanted to just um, see, uh, since Maisha is on the grassroots committee, Maisha, would, do you want to share like a minute update on work in Tallahassee um, that's currently happening today and what the group is doing today? Oh, just unmute yourself. It's okay. Technology is killing me. Sure. Listen, we've been um, pretty much educating and training people around this idea of uh, the NADA protocol. And the young people who are out here now in our community who are active in the Black Lives Matter movement, those who are part of the Dream Defenders, you know, those young people have ideas about things they like to do. And so I've been talking with the Poor People's Campaign and some of the folks from the um, Dream Defenders crew. And that, you know, that group started out of Tallahassee back with Trayvon Martin in 2012, I believe. And they've been doing really great work around uh, organizing community uh, around social justice. And so in our small group of uh, activists, we are engaging much more with social justice work and um, educating those organizers who are out there on the streets, who are grassroots people in many ways about ways they can help. And so getting them an opportunity to participate in training is one of the goals we have set for ourselves and getting them uh, more informed about the protocol and what actually they can use that protocol to assist in the work that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So we've just now finished a, a very great um, election last night. Some of our people got elected. And so I know we'll have some ways to move forward now. Isn't that a great thing? <laughs> some folks are thinking like we are, and hopefully we'll see some transitioning, more transitioning going on. Tallahassee has been um, introduced to a lot of uh, new ideas and in the 70s, in, in the early 80s, when we were doing the acupuncture clinic right here in Tallahassee, was the very first in the Southeast, of course. And back in those days, folks were wide open and knocking the doors down for acupuncture. So uh, we're now, and thanks to Yvette, we're trying to figure out new ways of engaging with the acupuncturists themselves um, to support um, the work of the acupuncture detox specialists, which you think is really a major effort now. And everybody needs relaxation and understanding of how to reduce stress and the anxiety that's been associated with the trauma in our community has been overwhelming. So we're focusing a lot with well-being, mental well-being, and hopefully with some funding we're looking forward to with the Blue Foundation, we'll be able to push that effort even more around community education and awareness of the NADA protocol. Uh, one of the things we hopefully to do is to um, orientate more the teenagers to this work because these people, they're out there, they're the ones who are taking the, the mantle and doing the charge in our community a lot more now. And so what it would look like engaging those communities. And so that's one reason moving forward with um, the Dream Defenders because they are made up of very young people and seeing where they can um, get that type of training in how to apply the, uh, those seeds and use the beads in the community that are non-threatening and getting the young people thinking more of uh, taking care of themselves and healing themselves. So I'm very excited to be part of this project. We're doing another training coming soon and we're gonna have some more ideas for you all in terms of how you can take this practice and move it forward um, in the work that you do on a daily basis, particularly with young people. Uh, one of the things, I'm, I'm going to have to get on another Zoom call. Um, one of the things I want to say is I met with some people yesterday who run, who basically a racial justice network here. And we talked about them learning more about the protocol and working with people who are protesting and under stress here in Minneapolis. So that is one of the things that I, we wanted to do here and not a wanted to do, I had talked to Kenny about if we can connect with those grassroots groups here, if nothing else, to at least introduce them to the protocol uh, that we would do that. So I did meet with some people and we're gonna see move on further with some other meetings and uh, try to work at making that could I, happen could I, soon. Okay. Cool. Could I ask you a question about that? Go ahead. Um, are you, hi, Nate, it's Ruth. Um, are you doing just the beads on one point or are you doing the whole protocol? Well, I have them, I, I, you know, I've given the website. We will work with the beads. I am also uh, doing the political piece. Uh, as I talked to one state rep and explained it to him. And he said, well, is there a law actually saying you can't do it? Not that I really know of. And his comment was, "Well, then do it." Mm. But you okay. Know, so, but uh, you in know the how training, that works. You, hey, been there. Um, but you're just you're going to do all. I mean, three points rather than just Shenmen River Shenmen. I would uh, preferably uh, do River Shenmen uh, to uh -huh. start out with, and then move forward. If I can get a waiver to actually do points. Yeah, got it. Okay. I, I will do thank that. Thank you. All right. You inspire me. You inspire me. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Everybody have a good day. Calling in from Philly and um, things have been, you know, as the world is going up and down um, all the time. But I guess I'll just share briefly that um, I got to know Nada at the conference that was in March of last year in Austin, and I've been somewhat able to participate with the grassroots committee calling in when possible. I would say that because of the legal situation in Pennsylvania, I haven't been able to formally practice since being trained here, but uh, what that looked like for me was traveling to New York and practicing with um, Salud Acupuntura del Pueblo when they have their free clinics 
So okay. um, that has been inspiring because it is really uh, carrying on the legacy of, um, you know, grassroots work and uh, coupled with very political people that are coming at this work um, as a liberation practice. Um, and so that's very important to me. And I think that, you know, I would love to continue to work with the grassroots committee in making, you know, the really rich history, which I also was supplemented today from the people that shared. So thank you so much, mm -hmm. um, you know, to the people that shared this, this afternoon. Um, and I hope that we can, you know, continue to honor the people that, that you know, put their lives on the line um, quite literally in the past and not erase their memory in any way um, and celebrate them and also fight for them. Uh, because as we see currently, the struggle um, continues. And, you know, I think that if we decouple the uh, political social conditions from our work, um, you know, we stay on the hamster wheel. Um, mm, nice. So nice. That's all I'll share, but thank you so much. And um, mm -hmm. thank you. I clearly think the most important thing is support. Mm -hmm. I, I clearly, I, I think the other thing is, um, we realize that we have ancestors past and living and we're continuing that. This came about as a result of grassroots effort. Mm -hmm. Communities, in the South Bronx, the stakeholders, Panthers, Lords, White, White Panther Party, health activists, nationalists said, we're tired of this. We don't want this. We don't want Big Farm. We don't want, we want a holistic approach. And, and it, they didn't wait. They took over a hospital wing. They didn't wait. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of taking that same energy along and we're allowing that space for people who understand that. You know, I think about the Aboriginal, um, gosh, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm blanking her name. But, but she talked about if, you, if you're coming because you want to help us, you're wasting your time. But if you're coming here because you see your liberation intimately tied to our liberation, my liberation, let's do this together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what guides me as to what the grassroots committee is about. Sure, I think it's, it's very important um, to understand the history of, of things and moving forward because it gives a foundational um, approach to work. And not only that, it gives us an opportunity to share with younger people and helping them to uh, garner that history and forward the practices that go along with those values and the concepts that were really broadened with the help of um, Dr. Smith. So just in my own experience, having the transformation occur before my eyes in, in the project that we've been doing in St. Louis, it's really amazing to have people who are who've never been exposed to acupuncture sit in a chair and dare if someone put a needle in them and actually come out feeling like a whole new person. That's, that was remarkable. And the way that he handled them, you know, is much more uh, than a physician-patient relationship that we now see. So it's important for us to care for not only the spirit that Dr. Um, Smith brought with this protocol, but the actual foundational work that um, helped to bring it all to fruition. So, certainly, I agree. As collective, of course, we definitely work with collaborations and partnerships in everything that we try to do. Um, that's part of our foundation. And expanding that work uh, around um, different groups across lines of divisions and lines of diversity you know, makes a difference. It's just not targeted for any particular group, uh, individuals, but for the whole people who are dealing with 
social justice, you know, particularly those who want to see equitable um, uh, distribution of resources in our community, um, those who want to reduce the economic um, gap that we have uh, with uh, income and housing and all those types of things going on in our area. So it has to be collective in our mind. And this uh, protocol is really the, in, for me, a, a balance piece that can help to bring a whole nother level of thinking to organizers everywhere, no matter what area you're in, you know, because it gives you something to work with and people immediately have a trust for it once they've established the fact that they're gonna sit in that chair. <laughs> And uh, they would tell the story for you. You don't have to do much telling beyond that. So it speaks for itself in a sense. Now I know Dr. Adam is on here. I know he's had, he's a new person uh, in our training. So I don't know if he has any offerings about what that might do uh, for young people. I uh, haven't had the experience he's had already with um, using the protocol. Dr. Adam, would you have anything to say on that? Are you there? Greeting, greetings to you all. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, greetings to you all. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with who I am, um, Atum Bukman. Um, my name is Dr. Adam. Uh, I am a medical doctor and uh, been trained by my Jagna, uh, Baba Zaid. Uh, Dr. Haynes uh, definitely did an excellent job with familiarizing me with uh, the NADA protocol and also given the historical context for uh, why we as a nation need to be employing this technique. Uh, and so the work that I have done uh, within the community and the people that I ha that have benefited from the skill set that I acquired uh, has been tremendous. Um, and so the work that we're doing to really push it through policy uh, and make sure that we are all uh, protected and supported uh, is, is absolutely necessary because we, we're doing too much through wasting resources and other means when we have this very viable uh, technique and protocol in place that can really provide relief to, to hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Mm -hmm. I'm currently working um, with a, the, the Department of Behavioral Health uh, and Sciences in the Florida State University College of Medicine. And we're focusing on um, behavioral health in general, but also maternal, uh, peri perinatal maternal health. And so uh, this is something that I'm definitely going to uh, work in to what they're already doing, uh, present it so that uh, we can also have another space to work through because there, there are plenty of mothers um, and we know mothers come with families, right? So the children and the, the, the other men and women that are involved with that family uh, is something that will, def or people that will benefit from uh, this protocol. I wanted to just build um, on uh, something that Yao had said earlier and just as we're, you know, as you're listening to this conversation and thinking, wow, you know, I really want to be part of the committee. I wanted to just um, share th that the committee, this committee and some of the other ones are really, really are focused on support. And um, you had asked Tanea also about, you know, are there, are people kind of sharing about their individual work? Or are there collective projects? And I think in general, it, it's real like the support comes from the listening because I'm feeling mm -hmm. so supported just listening to everybody sharing here about how they're utilizing NADA, the vision that each one in this room is holding for the NADA. It's like each of you holds the universe in your eye, right? Mm -hmm. Like you hold the possibility of how NADA, how expansive that it can go to millions. I just got goosebumps when Dr. Mm -hmm. Adam said that I was like, wow, yes. <laughs> like that's the NADA movement, you know? And, um, and so um, I, when you hear the word committee and maybe, you know, um, in the new, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know, our, 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 our like therapized self, we'll just like let, let go of the word committee because that can feel like, <laughs> oh, this is, you know, people who have the answer getting together and talking and making decisions. And, you know, it's, it's really just maybe a support group, but it's more than just a support Elective. group. Collective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love that word that we've used that uh, either, yeah. you know, internally, we're used it a lot. Um, so don't feel intimidated 
Okay, Grassroots Collective. So if you want to join the Grassroots Collective, you know, just know that it's a space where you can just share about what your experience is. And you also can just go in and listen. Like you don't have to feel that you have to come with this like mm -hmm. real strong, well, here's what I did last month and you share it. Like, you know, just get the support. Um, and mm -hmm. you might get an idea. You might get some sort of inspiration from the group to do something in your community. Um, so I really want to just take away this feeling of any intimidation that a person might have. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I can't take away your personal experience with joining a group because we all have an experience of what it's like to be a newbie somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so if you joined this group today, which could have felt like an intimidating thing when sometimes Zoom is, like this is what maybe a grassroots collective uh, call is like, like you just had one, <laughs> we, you were just part of it. So um, uh, I think that uh, Mary shared it a little bit earlier in the chat. So you can scroll up, there's a link and you can just click on it and put your name in. If it's, if the grassroots collective is really like the one you want to be a part of, but know that if you really have a passion for wanting to like change the law in your state, by the way, now is the time to do that because there is so much like, re-examining of structures and how do we provide services and how are we going to do things this is a great time to be approaching um, lawmakers and making a suggestion for something new that really helps people that we know helps people so you know think about really where your passion is um, we're we're really shining a lens on the grassroots committee because it's uh, a really critical one and has it's such a beautiful uh, committee um, but you know, think of just your own passion and what, what would you like to be a part of? Um, so that's just, I wanted to make a plug. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, thank you for that. That's straight from the heart. Uh, we really appreciate you speaking on that, Sarah, because it's, it's something that I think all of us should be reminded is to uh, be confident in who you are uh, and find that confidence in in an open space, in a space where you are accepted, where where you are allowed to imagine, you are allowed to uh, dream and, and really think about what what is the way that we can work collectively to uh, bring an actual effect. Uh, so thank you for, for instilling that into all of us. I just wanted to follow up from something that Sarah said as far as getting together to just connect of what we've been up to. I think a uh, purpose that it also serves and can serve more is coming together in terms of what we want to dream together and what we would like to carry out, you know, whether it is collectively or whether it is bringing it back to our communities that we serve. Um, and I'm bringing that up because it feels like, you know, as our um, country has been under such turmoil, you know, since always really, but that it's getting a little bit more of a spotlight now. You know, this is when people that, you know, do identify as community organizers, as activists, as people working in their communities to see change that we can, you know, even further the conversations within, you know, the medical industry, within the acupuncture industry, within, you know, all of the different communities that we're a part of. And so I'm, inspired by what uh, Sarah said and what everybody here has, has said, but also would love to push us all individually and collectively further um, in terms of what we can do, because, you know, it's bringing up so many different, you know, angles of, of our work, but also, you know, how can we all um, be better? How can we move, you know, NADA as an organization to serve us, to serve the people more in terms of where it was originally birthed? Mm -hmm. I can't raise a hand, but I'd love to ask a question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, it's Ruth Ackerman. Um, in, in some of this, or maybe a lot of the grassroots, the, the expenses for beads or needles or whatever, do you think that NADA could send out a fundraising letter asking for donations to specifically underwrite the costs of beads, for example, if you take them out into a community? Because otherwise it's coming out of the, most agencies don't have money for this, coming out of the pockets of the people who are trying to get the treatments done. And anyway, I leave you with that thought. I mean, I'm still on, but 
That's a fantastic because. idea, Ruth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ruth. That's a very doable thing. Okay. Uh, and P.S. This is such an inspirational thing. I just wanted to share what's clicking in my mind. I'm locked away in one of these senior communities where you can't visit anybody and people are getting super depressed. Hmm. And it seems to me that I could do a NADA training right here for the nurses here mm. to do the ear beads. And then we could go around to all these communities which are really identifying as having very depressed, isolated seniors. Hmm. So anyway, that's my thought for the day. This is a, I, I wonder if uh, we can make some more use of um, YouTube or Facebook to, um, sort of put uh, images out, perhaps uh, one of the groups that's, that's actually doing, um, you know, group treatments could, could video, video it, take a video and put, put it on Facebook or mm. put it on YouTube. Um, that might help to get it out to a, a broader audience and might invite, you know, people to, uh, call in or see if they could be involved in it or, you know, ask some questions. Um, one, one of the things that um, for some reason Michael Smith was, was able to do, and he didn't do it himself, because what he was doing was just, um, what that clinic was doing was so powerful that the word got out, it became part of a movement at that time. And we, we kind of lack that now, we kind of lack a, um, a way to get national get you know get national exposure mm -hmm. and i'm just thinking if there's a way that perhaps um, we could put together kind of a format that could go out on on youtube where people could see it and and then and react or respond or whatever sure sure i would be happy to help edit that in any way um do you have any ideas for people who uh, are willing to record themselves or have their group recorded? Well, I, I, I don't know, but um, the, the lady from California with that great hat. Rachel. Mm -hmm. Rachel, yeah. The hat with the great hat. I was thinking of her too. <laughs> she might be willing to, to do that mm -hmm. or someone else. She's already kind of doing it. Um, so maybe she could do, you know, put together something, but we just need to get more yeah. exposure. And those guys in New York, um, who are doing that street outreach, you know, they're really doing some yeah. awesome stuff, you know, I don't know about filming yeah. and that kind of thing, but maybe yeah, you can give us some heads up on that because that to me is where we're at, you know, on the streets, outreaching, getting people engaged as much as we can, particularly with some of the populations that are out there now. We need that help and intervention right away. I like that idea. Thanks, Ayu. Mm -hmm. um, I can talk to Rachel. I have you're a saying something. He's not getting you on mute. I'm so, I, I, I'm so sorry. I was just going to say just real briefly, I think there's a lot of that's already in the archives. Uh, salute. I know yeah. I see posts from them that are awesome. And, and mm -hmm. I, every week they have something. So we should almost maybe have a little se separate uh, YouTube channel for them. But right. definitely, I'm, I'm like boomer kind of, and the, the media thing, I, I, mean, I don't really know how to do it. But you know what? That is so true. Let's get them on and, and, and let's do that. Um, and, and I know I, I'm running under the tyranny of the clock, but I am coming out of this with one, ha, we are no longer a committee. We get, we, we're dropping that linear, that, that quantitative, you know, kind of Western way of thinking. We're making this, you know, in a circular kind of way, and I'm loving it. We're, we're saying it is okay to come to a space and really have nothing about, like, where is our destination? Hey, dreams, <laughs> possibilities. And see, that's very different from all of us that have been trained in this goddamn system. So, yes, I love it. We are now the Grassroots Collective, okay? And we are now that, okay? I'm loving this shit. Okay? I love y'all. Peace and love. Daeed, I'd love to talk with you more. My issue, you know, big sister, I love you and everybody else. I love y'all. Keep up your good work. Next time. That's some powerful energy right there.
<laughs> the essence of grassroots. Uh, Yvette, you know, in terms of um, how do we get the physicians, the acupuncturists, to uh, really connect with us and align with us and the work we're doing and get them on board. I think that's a really wonderful way to start thinking about how this collective and the value of the work that has been done and then bringing forth the the actual docs who are practicing acupuncture every day um, to understand what we do and how how passionate we are about what we do. So I don't want to forget that. Just a word on that. Uh, I, I think the main thing we have to do is continue to be organized uh, and then also acquire uh, those people who will support it within the community. Doctors tend to do what other doctors are doing, uh, most of them. And so the more that we have support from uh, doctors of, of different denominations, right? Uh, not just acupuncturists, but if we could get uh, other doctors that are uh, MDs, that are PhDs, that are just doctorates, period, um, that will help acquire those physicians that are, that are then going to, uh, which is unnecessary, it's un- it's, to my in my opinion, it's unfortunate and unnecessary that we would have to require sponsorship from other doctors to get doctors to co-sign. If you're just a thinking person and if you're an uh, empathetic person, uh, it, you, would, you would see that this is um, really what we call a no-brainer when you're talking about allowing people to be trained, um, especially through NADA, uh, to uh, acquire this skill set that has nothing but positives. So, so the more that we make our presence, the more that we continue to uh, gather that sponsorship in the forms of our grassroots movement, I think uh, we will continue to um, rec- be recognized by people who will help us to continue to move and continue to shape uh, the reality and, and, and shape it into, into what we need um, as a collective. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. I am from New York, from Long Island, Suffolk County, and um, I found out about Nautic Protocol, actually when I came to Austin, (laughs) and um, was trained by others that Claudia had trained and took it back home because we have a big population of drug addicts and alcoholics and people that just have mental issues. And um, at the time I was a nurse and I was able to practice legally doing the NADA protocols and um, I decided I wanted the training myself. So I went to in and I met Dr. Smith and the crew and Nancy and everybody and got my own certificate, Carlos taught me. And then I traveled the world. I did um, nurse traveling. I lived on the Navajo Nation and uh, did a little bit of that. I lived in seven countries, 29 states, uh, went to medical school, um, came back. I now live in Austin, Texas with Claudia. And um, with my husband, we work for the federal government and we deal with immigrants. Immigrants that are waiting to get their documentation to stay in the country. So they are detained. So when we go, you know, we try to help them be comfortable in their setting. So with that, we're all over the place. If it wasn't for COVID, I wouldn't be in Austin. I might be in Arizona, I might be in California, I might be, you know, 
in New York, I'm, I'm, and maybe all over. You know, we go all over the place. So I don't have a base because we're all over the place. So um, I'm now trying to be focused here in Austin. And I've applied to the city to get some monies to get a place so we can deal with the homeless population, which we've always dealt with because the offices that we've had in Austin, they close the offices because Austin is selling it off all of their properties to make condos. So all of the places I've had to practice here with our populations, they're gone. You know, so as I was telling Tanea last, last month, um, there's no place for me to practice my protocols the way that I want to practice them, you know, without charging people, you know, exuberant amount of money because the rent and everything is so high. You know, you want to give everything away. So that's where I am. Trying to find a place so I can give away and help out. Nafisa, that makes any sense to anybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nafisa, this is Sarah. Um, I want to just let you know that my start with NADA started in Austin, and I was a street youth worker with the LifeWorks Street Outreach Program. Um, okay. And um, I'm familiar with a program called Street Youth Ministries. Um, I don't know if mm -hmm. you're familiar. Do you know Terry Cole and... Yeah. Okay. I, I was going to say, I don't know if he has a space either. I know he's always worked out of churches, but um, I, I mean, I don't have, I haven't been in Austin now for um, over 10 years, but um, I'm happy to try to mine my contacts to see if there's any way to support that work that you're doing. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah. I don't even know if LifeWorks is around anymore, but I worked with them for... Yeah. A while. They are. They, they're they still here. Yeah, but they, I know they dismantled their street youth program. They got rid of it. Yes, they did. Yes. <laughs> we, uh, anyways. Uh, okay. Thanks for the work you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Care, um, everybody that was on street care, they had two offices care under the mental health, mental retardation, gone you know, they sold them in their now condos. So even though we had the most rundown, nastiest buildings, they were there and we could do what we needed to do. And now they're gone. So, um, yep. And you can see it in Austin. If any of you came to Austin to our conference, there are, the condos are plentiful and they are expanding and they're all over the place. And it's really, it, it like has completely changed the landscape of that city. I didn't even recognize some streets because I was like, oh my God, there's like 10 story buildings here now. Um, and we even struggled a lot at the time with doing outreach because the main, they call it the drag that goes along um, UT Austin. So many businesses were up there that had so much money, but that's where all the street youth were used to kind of congregating and getting, um, you know, meeting and, and, and um, panhandling and all of that. And then they were being kicked out of that area. So everybody, they kept getting pushed back and pushed back. You know, they didn't really have anywhere to be in the city um, safely. So uh, that's, I know, um, a reality in many cities. It's very visible in Austin because it's a warm place. And so people can be outside. But, yes, that is a benefit. That's the benefit that New Yorkers don't have. And that's the benefit that they have in Austin. They can be out of the street for almost year round, which is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But under the bridges, you know, it looks like how California used to look. 